Well, okay, folks, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks for joining the Mass Cancer Center seminar series today. And presenting will be Dr. Griffin and Dr. Jack Tepp. Dr. Griffin, take it away at this point. All right, good morning, everyone. So this is, a, I think, kind of a, a two-way or, or a two-fold presentation. Partly it's a research presentation. There'll be some research going uh, that we've been doing. But um, also, a, as part of this, it's sort of an informational seminar on this thing called the Proteogenomics Core, which uh, in the Cancer Center Renewal, this is a developmental core that we put in in this to offer services and to, to offer sort of collaborative uh, services to researchers in the Cancer Center in this area called proteogenomics. So we hope we can describe to you what that is a bit and give you a, a touch on sort of how it could be potentially useful in your, your research. So that's the, the other um, motivation and objective here. Um, the work that you're going to see is very collaborative. I'm not going to touch on everyone in this slide, but I just wanted to point out uh, this is a joint presentation between myself and Pratik Jagtap, who sort of co-leads this research with me. Um, these are some folks from the laboratory who have really heavily contributed to some of the things you're going to see, um, as well as we work with the Supercomputing Institute and developers there, JJ uh, and Tom McGowan, have, have definitely contributed all along the way. I'm going to touch on a few of ongoing collaborations with some cancer center uh, members with some of these, these tools. Um, and also just wanted to say a lot of this work has been supported through an uh, NCI grant, the Information Technology or Informatics Technology for Cancer Research Program that we've been a part of. So, okay, the outline. Um, so what, what I'm hoping to do is start out with a bit of sort of the, the definition of what is proteogenomics and give you a sense of how it can be useful. Uh, a little of the challenges that we've been working on sort of research tools, and this is very much a bioinformatics issue that we've been developing tools to try to solve. A little bit about some applications. Um, and then I'm going to hand it over to Pratik, who's going to talk about uh, sort of an extension of proteogenomics in a slightly different um, way, and that is metaproteomics. So the ability to do sort of functional characterization of microbial communities that obviously has a lot of uh, impact and significance these days as people look at microbiome contributions to cancer and other things. So that is, is sort of the, the focus and kind of following what is part of this proteogenomics core in terms of some of the things we could do uh, to help along with, with projects. So uh, very quickly, I don't want to dwell too much on this. I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page. What we're talking about here, whether it's this proteogenomics application or uh, metaproteomics, um, is it's really focused around mass spectrometry-based proteomics data and ways to integrate that with, say, genomic, transcriptomic data that, that you're going to see. So sort of the starting point and sort of the um, focal point of some of the data we collect and are analyzing comes from the mass spectrometer. Just very briefly, these are, are samples where we start with intact proteins isolated from samples, digest these to peptides. These get pushed through a mass spectrometer, so a mixture of peptides that runs through a mass spectrometer using chromatography as a gradient to separate them out. We uh, fractionate those, and then we, in the, in the instrument, select each peptide uh, of some amino acid sequence that we don't know yet. And we fragment that peptide. We collect the masses of those fragments that can be detected. So we, we, we uh, collect this tandem mass spectrum or this MS2 spectrum, which is the fragmentation of a single peptide, gives you this fingerprint of that sequence. And then it's a, the job of some bioinformatics and software to try to take this raw MSMS spectrum, so this fragmentation spectrum of a peptide sequence, and try to match and annotate a peptide sequence to it. So that's our first objective. Uh, we do that through protein sequence database searching. Uh, so we take a database of known protein sequences. We basically, in silico, carve those up into all the possible peptides and all of their predicted fragmentation patterns. Then we match them to these that we've actually recorded from our sample. Uh, we get a match to a peptide sequence, as you can see here, and then we can use that uh, to infer what protein did this come from within, say, that starting mixture. So pretty routine, rather mature uh, workflow for doing mass spectrometry-based proteomics. Um, the twist here with proteogenomics is that it, it becomes apparent that this is a fine process, but where it starts to have some limitations are 
if you look at the process here is we're using this protein sequence database and the question becomes, well, what if my protein sequence due to some, some variant, some mutation, some splice variant, whatever it might be, uh, isn't actually in that database. Can I actually find a, a peptide sequence using this approach if, if that's the case? And so to address that limitation, um, there's been this move towards integrating next generation sequencing data with proteomics. So I'll just focus on say RNA-seq. So now you have the ability to take a sample, get RNA-seq data that you can assemble to a transcriptome, uh, use that assembled, those assembled transcript sequences to in silico translate out potential protein products. And this can include known coding sequences and all those things, but also uh, also translating out potential novel variants or expression from, from genomic locations that you may not expect. Uh, really kind of the sky's the limit as to what you might include in this database. But it becomes more comprehensive, more specific to the sample that you're actually analyzing. And now this gives you a chance to actually start at the protein level to get verification of expression of, of, of variant sequences or novel uh, translation products that, that you actually have uh, evidence are, are actually being expressed. So that's how it all kind of comes together here is now you have this customized sequence database uh, based on this next gen sequencing data that you've, you've uh, developed and have putative protein sequences in it. You now take your actual uh, proteomics data from your sample. So you take, say, the same sample, collect all these, these fragmentation spectra, match them into this database. You get these hits to peptides. And then uh, via informatics, based on the amino acid sequences, you can go back and see where on the genome did these, were these peptides encoded uh, and, and get a better sense of, of, of potential variants that might be there. So this is just a, an example of how that might work. Um, you start to see translation products from unexpected uh, genomic regions. Uh, with encoding regions, you start to pick up indels and single amino acid changes that may be there, as well as peptides that maybe span boundaries of exons so that you can start to confirm, and that's kind of what this part of this, this graphic is showing, start to confirm confirm uh, splice variants that are being expressed at the protein level if you start to see amino acid sequences that span some of these boundaries. So lots of potential uh, applications of this, of, of finding protein evidence of variants, um, as well as, as I'll, I'll touch on, things such as uh, immuno-oncology applications, so a way to, to start to look for neoantigens. So uh, a variety of places where this is, is potentially applicable. Um, and again, kind of the power being that it goes beyond just what you've predicted from the RNA-seq data to actually giving you some hard evidence at the protein level um, that these are actually turning into a protein product that may have some functional uh, uh, impact. Um, and I put this in here. This is one of the driving methods behind this CPTAC, so this, this program at the, at the NCI of proteomics analysis of tumors, and they are using this sort of multiomic approach to sort of layer all these, these pieces of information on top of each other to really deeply interrogate different types of tumors and different cancer types. So we had gotten interested in this a while ago as kind of a new and emerging way to do, do proteomics with obviously lots of interesting power and application. And it was immediately apparent that it, it's a nice concept, but to actually do this in practice, it's going to be a pretty big informatics challenge because suddenly us who kind of lived over in this sort of corner of the world, which is all about just mass spec proteomics data, needed to expand our horizons into uh, integrating it with genomic, transcriptomic data. Uh, and then there's some, some other kind of challenges when you actually identify these variants of how do you actually filter and make sure that these are correct and confident and aren't just false positives, and ultimately try to interpret and, and visualize these, say, by mapping them to a genome and understanding them. So a lot of sort of issues that popped up. And so we started to turn to some solutions for this. How do we do this in a, in a more routine way? How do we potentially do it in a way that if we develop these tools, it could help the community to incorporate these and use some of these, these informatics tools in, in their own work. And so it spawned this, this sort of area of research, kind of a new area of research for my laboratory, for, for sure, but in, into sort of bioinformatic development. Um, what we chose early on was to 
to use Galaxy, and I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with Galaxy as a sort of a workbench for omics data. Uh, it was developed for genomic data and a way to bring in lots of different software that, that analyzes genomic, transcriptomic data. Give your, yourself sort of a unified single environment to work with this software and integrate this software together um, and do it in a way that you could train others to use it so it's accessible. Um, and so we turned to this uh, as we started to think about how do we integrate proteomic and genomic data all together as a, as a really nice solution because it already had all of this, these mature tools and this community of users in the genomic space. And we started to um, add proteomics tools. So it's tools that we could use in our mass spec based proteomics. We called this the Galaxy for Proteomics Project or Galaxy P. And really that's kind of evolved uh, and, and now is beyond just proteomics doing a lot of this integrative multiomics work. And a little bit what you'll see here is that we also kind of chose this platform because we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We said there's a lot of software already out there to do all kinds of good things. Let's find a, an environment where we can pull these together and start to maybe make workflows and different things that are, are useful in, in new application areas without having to sort of from scratch develop all this software we need. So um, that's been this sort of driving project behind this, this Galaxy P project. And just a, a quick a little more about Galaxy. This is from Jeremy Gex, one of the developers of Galaxy. And, and it's really this environment which is really well suited for what we're doing and has been really successful because it kind of brings together this platform where you can bring in large amounts of data, so the data sets. Um, you, can, you can also then have a, this environment where you've implemented lots of different software tools as well as visualization. So very flexible kind of platform for doing a lot of different things bringing the data and the software together. This can be uh, implemented on various types of computing resources. Much of it's done in the cloud. You can do it locally. It has the ability to scale up to, to handle large data. Um, and, and really kind of brings this all together with the other nice piece being that it has an, a user interface that is, is definitely learnable. Um, professors can learn this. I always say that I learned this pretty quickly and it works. Um, so that's a that's a plus. You can also do this programmatically through an API, through command lines. So those who are more skilled in bioinformatics and, and programming can use this as well. And really kind of brings this all together in this powerful platform. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've utilized that in terms of developing some of these proteogenomic tools and then Pratequal as well in the metaproteomic space. So Back to sort of prote proteogenomics, um, our main sort of ob objective at the start was to start to, to develop sort of the core, what I kind of call processing workflows, which are taking raw RNA-seq data, uh, taking this through, you know, if those who work in this area will, will definitely recognize some of the software tools here, but taking these through kind of standard workflows and, and, and customizable workflows for annotating variants that are, are, are in, say, RNA-seq data, assembling and annotating variants that might be present, but then adding to that the ability to um, generate protein sequences out of these transcripts. So all, all of these are pointing towards making a protein sequence database, whether that be indels and single amino acid changes that are indicated from the RNA-seq data, or just novel, unexpected, non-normal types of transcripts. So making a sequence database, and then having the ability to sort of have a, in an automated way, pull in the mass spec based proteomics data that you want to match to this and going through the, the process of, of analyzing this. So that's been a, a big uh, sort of emphasis is just getting those tools. And one of the pieces here that's still kind of in, in process, and this is Andrew, who's a graduate student, has been helping try to work with this, is trying to not only make this processing workflow to identify potential variants, there's a lot of potential pitfalls when you're doing this for false positives that might pop up. So how do you get really confident results that we are actually seeing variants at the peptide level? He's been working in, in developing some Galaxy workflows that bring in a new tool called PepQuery. So after we identify these variants, we can run it through this other software, which really rigorously sort of tests whether or not those, these are really true matches. And ultimately, we're trying to, to sort of hand off for, for whether it's our work or others, the best, most confident data we can in terms of variants and, and things that we may have found in a sample. So 
it's, it's always has extensions and, and ways to improve this that we're continuing to work on. One area though that's been um, sort of a big point of emphasis is uh, sort of what do you do with this data? What's next? So rather than just hand over this big list of here's a bunch of proteins, um, good luck with these, we've been working on some ways to interpret the data. Um, so one of those is uh, is just the, the the need for sort of visualizing when you get a, a novel tra a transcript that you identify a protein from. How do you look at that in terms of mapping it to a genome, understand uh, some more about sort of the expression of this protein, what's the nature of the variant? So um, we developed what's called a multiomics visualization platform, or we call it MVP, which, which automatically comes off of this, this workflow for generating results. Gives us a whole number of functionalities to, to do some things. Um, this was uh, work by Tom McGowan mostly. It was really a team effort, but he kind of led the charge and it was just recently published. Um, but in the end, what it gives you is once you've identified, say, all these peptides in a sample, you can hone in on those peptide sequences that are carrying some sort of a amino acid change. So this is just an example of a, here's a peptide sequence that was identified. It maps back to a protein that has a, has a much longer sequence, that so this is where it lines up in that protein. In this case, this had a single amino acid change, this R. Um, so it was a Q to R amino acid substitution. And from this tool, you can actually sort of see where these variant peptides are and actually uh, it, map them back to the genome. So we're working with a, a version of the integrated genomics viewer, which we can automatically um, pop open. It starts to give you ability then to, to understand against the genome, what's the sort of translation frame, what are the RNA-seq data, which is being shown here, what was the assembled RNA-seq data that supported this, and gives you kind of that, that ability to start to characterize and look at, at some of these results, which ultimately is an important step in this whole process. Um, we've also worked with some other groups in a, in a collaborative way to help with this question of, okay, I get a variant, what, you know, what's the impact? Why do I care about these variants? Do they do anything? Which is obviously the, the next question. Um, so there's this very nice tool called CRAVAT, uh, Cancer-Related Analysis of Variants. And it is its own standalone tool. It, it's on a server, so you can go there. And, and it's really built uh, initially for, say, RNA-seq or, or genomic sequencing data, where you can input variants you found in your sample. And it will give you an output of where uh, of some of the impact, potentially, of these variants based on what's known about these variants, what's the protein they code for, and things like that. So we worked with the group at Johns Hopkins that developed this and said, wow, this would be a perfect tool for us because we're getting peptide level information, which is an added piece of information on these variants. But we would still like to also be able to know, you know what's the potential impact of any given variant sequence at, to a protein. So we coupled uh, Cravat with a Galaxy tool, and I'm not going to go too far into this, but other than to say that it now, once you get these outputs, you can now go to this Cravat tool and, and it, it basically intersects the peptide data with all of your RNA-seq data and comes straight out of a Galaxy workflow. You open it up and this just gives a, a, a sampling of sort of the output, which is very nice. So it, it utilizes this Cravat database and knowledge base and some of its visualization tools so that um, you basically get a list of your variants. I know this is small, but in this column that we've added here, this is where those variants are, but are, and it shows any peptide level information and confirmation that you might have had. And then a whole variety of other tools that give you the ability to look at the linear protein, what are other uh, amino acid um, variants that are known within the coding region, some three-dimensional modeling if the structure exists as to where your variant is on the structure, links to this index tool, which is a, a great tool from UCSD and Trey Eidecker, which gives you uh, networks and interactions of any given proteins or genes that you're interested in. So adds a, another sort of set of tools to the toolbox. Um, and the last sort of little vignette here, and I'm just gonna kind of go relatively quickly here through this, is uh, this, this tool that we've developed. So one of the things that we're interested in, and a lot of people, I'm, I'm also the director of our core mass spec proteomics facility, a lot of people have RNA-seq and proteomics data, and they want to do a comparison of, at, the, at the quantitative level of what's the protein abundance response and the corresponding uh, RNA transcript response for the RNA that encoded that protein and understand how well do these correlate or potentially how well don't they correlate. 
Um, so we, I had done this work that the last figure was back when I was a postdoc and I'd done this all by hand in a very low throughput way. So finally we came back around to this and Praveen Kumar, who's a graduate student who's now uh, graduated, developed this tool called QuantiP where we now take uh, transcript abundances. We take the same sample with protein abundances, bring these together, sort of map and, and get the corresponding protein to transcript uh, coordinates and then look at how do the, these samples react in terms of protein response versus RNA response. And within QuantiP gives you a, a whole sort of suite of tools to do this. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all those details, but the, the idea here was to really make a kind of accessible tool that does this type of work, gives you an output, and, and also gives you a sort of a guide to which are the protein protein RNA pairs that are the most interest, maybe have the, the the largest discordance between their response that you might be the most interested in. So uh, Praveen is put into this to this Galaxy tool, and this is just a little piece of the, sort of the visualization that pops up, uh, a number of functionalities that, that help kind of a researcher do this analysis, but also get out of this sort of gene protein pairs that, that might be of most interest. So um, I think that was a tool that, that met a need. Um, in just the last couple of minutes before I give this over to Pratik, I just wanted to hit on um, where we're trying to use some of these tools. So these are some ongoing uh, proteogenomic projects with cancer center members. Um, I'll hit very briefly on the, the ongoing work. So we uh, have a grant that Dave Largaspata is the PI on that just got funded this last year from the NIH that I'll talk about with neoantigens, but also working in the space with, with others, um, Frank Andre, we are actually part of one of these ARP internal grants with Anya and Eric, uh, where we're gonna also try to, 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 to apply some of these tools. And also have some ongoing work with the Trechakova lab uh, doing some multi-omics work. Um, but I just had two slides here. I wanted to just quick hit on this ongoing project with, with Dave Larkaspada. Um, so really kind of a, a cool uh, project that Dave really spearheaded based on the, the expertise of his lab. But the idea here is to um, look for these neoantigen peptides, uh, and that's in this malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, MPNST uh, uh, model. And the idea being that, uh, without trying to go into too much depth here, um, there's these neoantigens that are, are, are expressed within this, this type of cancer, um, some of which just are due to frame shift mutations, but kind of the unique piece of this that Dave, Dave has come up with is that you can actually lengthen these, these neoantigens and produce these cryptic neoantigens via gentamicin uh, um, treatment. So there's a, an idea here is if we could actually identify some of these neoantigen peptides that are there, you could potentially make this into a prophylactic vaccine where you use these peptides to sort of activate the immune system. So that's the, the big picture of this. And so what we're trying to do is to actually identify these, these peptide level neoantigens and cryptic neoantigens is develop a workflow to do that. Um, it adds some, some layer of, of uh, uh, complexity, but it's the nice part about these workflows in this working galaxy is that we can sort of mix and match and add in new tools as needed. So um, part of this then becomes uh, getting HLA typing from the transcriptomic or genomic data to, to predict the MHC sequences, and then take that same data, um, pull out of their novel transcripts that you can translate into potential peptides and you can do predictions on which of those might bind the MHC. Um, so that's part of this, but also we can add into this an unbiased way of doing things and, and just look for novel transcripts, turn those into other possible peptides that may be uh, neoantigens, and then uh, hopefully, we're not there yet, but couple this with enriching the MHC complex uh, one or two um, and, and enriching those peptides that are actually bound, running these through the mass spectrometer and then matching these back to all these predicted possible peptides and hopefully if successful, actually identifying uh, these neoantigens. So just a, a little flavor of, of one application, application of this, these, these types of workflows. Okay. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Pratik. So I'll start with uh, where uh, Tim left off. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about um, metaproteomics, which is um, the study of proteins that are expressed by microorganisms, either in an environment or 
um, in, in tissue samples. And there has been a lot of studies on uh, studying microbiome, especially using uh, nucleic acid methods, um, you know, popularly known as metagenomics or metatranscriptomics. Uh, but we have started looking into metaproteomics um, in terms of looking at proteins that are expressed um, in, um, in, in microorganisms. So I'll give a, an overview about uh, informatic challenges as well as uh, some of the software that we have been developing uh, with some focus on um, the ideas to apply this to uh, cancer research. So um, as I said earlier, microbiome research has been um, in focus for uh, quite a few years and multiple studies have shown correlation of uh, the taxonomic composition of a microbiome or you know the, the, the microorganisms that are present in an environment with physiological conditions and this you know um, this has led to studies that have shown its importance in health and disease as well as um, if its effect on environment so uh, microbiome in general is studied um, in various ways uh, the most uh, popular uh, research method that has been used is metagenomics wherein research researchers look for microbial dna and then um, and then try to assess what are, what's the taxonomic composition of that particular microbiome. And for this, they either use uh, 16S rRNA methods, uh, also known as amplicon sequencing uh, or whole genome sequencing methods. Um, both of these methods help in understanding the taxonomy or the, the taxonomic composition and its correlation with, uh, with the physiology that's been studied and uh, gives some indication about the function of the genes that are present and mostly from uh, whole genome sequencing efforts, but there is most of it is uh, predictive and um, not an indication of what is actually getting expressed in a, micro in a microbiome situation. Um, the researchers have also started using metatranscriptomics. So in that case, you not only get an uh, idea about the taxonomy, but also see which um, RNA uh, molecules are expressed um, and then you can uh, try and go and find out what's the function uh, that these particular RNA molecules um, you know are, are associated with and that way you can also try to understand uh, which functions are getting expressed um, when, when you are studying um, your microbiome. For last few uh, being a mass spectrometry lab uh, we have actually been using uh, metaproteomics methods wherein uh, we actually look at uh, proteins that are expressed by the microorganisms, and that actually gives a much better understanding, not only about the taxonomy, but also uh, proteins and functions that are expressed by the microbiome. And we believe that uh, this, um, you know, either studying metaproteomics or metatranscriptomics has a potential to unravel mechanistic details of microbial interactions, uh, either if you're studying it in a tissue or in a uh, in host or in an environment if you're studying say for example soil samples or ocean samples um, and this somehow we feel that gives a better understanding of functional dynamics of uh, the microbiome i mean just to highlight this uh, this is a data from a bio a biogas cellulose uh, degradation data set uh, that has that we've been uh, studying this is an unpublished data set from uh, our collaborators in norway so on the left side, you can you'll see a, a PCA plot, a principal components uh, analysis plot, which uh, basically shows if you use taxonomy as an identifier, uh, you kind of uh, so these were basically samples at uh, different time points. T1 being the initial time point, and uh, T4, T6, and T7 being um, later time points during the cellulose degradation. As you can see, they kind of do not get separated as well if you use taxonomy as a uh, as a way to uh, separate these uh, samples, but when you use function, uh, you know, in, in particular, we use molecular function, uh, uh, gene ontology terms, you could see the separation is much better. Uh, this gives us a confidence that um, if you use function as, a, as an identifier, then uh, it can actually separate your, um, separate your samples in a much better manner than uh, if you were to use taxonomy as, a, uh, as an identifier. And we have seen this for not only this data set, but other data sets as well. Um, and we have been kind of, uh, you know, using metaproteomics as a way to uh, study microbiomes. So uh, there has been uh, some interest, uh, growing interest, in fact, in the, in the field of cancer microbiome. The idea is to understand the role of microorganisms uh, in cancer progression. Um, and there have been quite a few studies uh, wherein microorganisms have been implicated in their uh, role in 
uh, cancer progression or even in um, uh, and, and there has there have been some studies that have indicated that if you use the uh, the right uh, mix of organisms uh, you could also try to uh, use that as a therapy however challenges exist in trying to understand the mechanism of how a microbiome or you know a micro microorganisms interact uh, with the host tissue and how does it um, either uh, start uh, cancer progression or it, um, you know, how, how does it even um, initiate some of these uh, initial events? Um, and then, uh, so our uh, idea is to, instead of using taxonomy methods, uh, the idea would be to use uh, complementary microbiome uh, methods such as uh, metaproteomics, metatranscriptomics. And the idea would be to uh, understand the functions that are expressed by these microorganisms so that one can um, identify these, um, identify the role of these microorganisms uh, in, in cancer progression. So what we have started basically doing is working on some informatics workflows um, and uh, for metaproteomics, uh, basically um, what we basically have started doing is we, we start working on database generation. So if you have fast Q files from your RNA-seq data or from your um, metagenomics uh, data, uh, you, you can convert it using certain software tools into a protein or peptide FASTA file. Um, we generally generate mass, spectra, mass spectral data, um, and that is then matched against this protein database that has been generated using the search algorithm, which uh, ends up in identification of peptides. And then uh, once you have these peptides identified, um, you can uh, assign these peptides uh, to a unique taxonomy, and that leads us to identify, uh, identification of some uh, taxa that are present in your microbiome. This could be at the genera level, species level, or even at the strain level. Um, for uh, peptides, um, and you can, you can also uh, assign these peptides to proteins, and based on uh, these proteins, you can assign them to functions using uh, either KEG methodology or using gene ontology method methodology, and that basically leads us to um, identification of um, of the function of proteins that are expressed. So again, all of these are modules that we have developed as as workflows um, for database generation, for database search and strategies, um, for taxonomy analysis, um, and then uh, and then you can also uh, use it for functional analysis. Um, one thing to remember is, apart from the known function uh, proteins of known function, uh, we also have a lot of proteins which. Um, cannot be assigned a function. I mean, they are basically called hypothetical proteins. Uh, so there's a lot of information which is unknown, uh, and we wanted to tap into that information by looking at the quantitative changes of not only proteins of known function, but also proteins of um, unknown function or hypothetical function. So for that, we have developed some methods which uh, use quantitative analysis, um, either by using spectral counts or intensity data. Uh, and so we have these workflows now kind of, um, you know, encompassing the entire uh, an, a data, data analysis pipeline, starting from database generation to uh, quantification of uh, functions or taxonomy uh, of that particular microbiome. So uh, this is just, um, uh, an, you know, the, the workflow uh, in terms of the tools that are, the software tools that have been implemented in Galaxy um, and, you know, to not go into much details, uh, just to highlight some of the things here, uh, peptide identification is basically done by tools such as search crew and peptide shaker. Again, uh, some of the work that we have been doing with our collaborators. Um, and, and then uh, we perform peptide quantification by using a tool called flash LFQ. And then uh, another tool called Unipept uh, basically helps us to identify function as well as taxonomy of the peptides, uh, the proteins and the peptides that uh, that we have identified. So uh, this is um, an example of this uh, Unipept tool, uh, which is an application that has been uh, developed from uh, University of Ghent by, um, by Bart Messier. Uh, this basically uh, helps us to, uh, you know, use peptides as an input. So peptides that have been identified in our mass spectrometry data can be used as an input. And what it basically outputs is visual outputs of um, the taxonomy tree, as well as uh, a tabular output of taxonomy, as well as functional outputs in terms of gene ontology, um, EC numbers, as well as um, recently, they also uh, added interpro terms that could be used to 
identify the function of these um, of these proteins. So by using these tools, uh, basically what we did was uh, we ended up uh, developing our own tool called as MetaQuantum. Uh, this was did, done by uh, a student named uh, Caleb Israeli. Um, and the idea here in this tool is that if you have your peptides that we have identified through our um, mass spectrometry um, pipeline, uh, and we have uh, and after assigning uh, the quantitative values using MS1 intensities, uh, functional annotation, as well as taxonomic annotation, uh, we can input this data into this tool, uh, MetaQuantum, and what it basically does is uh, it gives you outputs uh, which can help you um, to explore the data uh, in terms of bar diagrams to show you what are the different um, taxonomy outputs that come out, differential uh, abundance of go terms as well as taxonomy that's present in the microbiome as well as cluster analysis using heat map analysis so um, and we have used this tool uh, for quite a few um, uh, projects now uh, i'll just highlight one of the projects uh, along with uh, professor Joel redney from the dental school uh, in this particular study um, he had uh, 12 subjects who had um, uh, basically uh, whose plaque samples were collected so these were um, uh, plaque samples from uh, patients which had dental caries um, and then uh, the idea was to grow these uh, in a biofilm reactor so the idea was to um, to to enrich the microorganisms that are present in these plaque samples now these plaque samples were grown in two different conditions, uh, in two different biofilm reactor conditions. One was um, in presence of sucrose, and the idea was to identify the effect of sucrose on uh, this microbiome, uh, as well as in absence of sucrose. So uh, as you can see on the right side here is uh, the green line basically shows uh, the pH of um, the control samples, wherein uh, there was no uh, sugar that was added, while the red one uh, shows um, uh, you know, times wherein sugar was um, pulsed into um, in, into the samples, so that um, and and this shows a drop in pH um, when when that, that was done. So uh, basically, the samples were collected at 50 hour time points, and this was done for 12 dif 12 different samples, so 12 pairs of with sugar and without sugar, and then mass spec data was collected for all these 12 samples. Um, we basically went ahead and performed. Uh, quantitation, functional annotation, as well as taxonomic assignment, and then subjected to the meta quantum uh, tool that we showed earlier. So um, after using meta quantum, uh, we could basically identify the most abundant uh, genera in uh, in the control samples, as in which shown here. So Fusobacterium was the most um, uh, abundant um, uh, genus in this particular uh, in, in the control samples while streptococcus was uh, supposed to be the ones that that was uh, the most abundant genera in in um, in the sugar uh, induced condition and then uh, we also used um, uh, used uh, meta quantum to generate these volcano plots um, as you can see if you use taxonomy um, we could uh, basically identify some of the um, some of the uh, organisms that were upregulated in presence of sugar and some that were downregulated in presence of sugar. Uh, we could also identify quite a few uh, go terms, uh, either biological processes, cellular component or molecular function. And you know, one could then go and identify which of these are, um, which, which seem to be uh, important in terms of um, it, the interaction of these microorganisms with, with sucrose. Um, we also could use uh, PCA plots like I showed earlier. Um, so we basically, uh, the ones in blue are the samples which are uh, control samples and the ones in uh, orange are the samples wherein uh, sugar was induced. And as you can see, when taxonomy used uh, was an identifier, there was, this, there was not much uh, separation amongst the samples. But when we used um, function, uh, in particular uh, go terms uh, of molecular function, we could see that uh, the control sample seems to be uh, clustering together as compared to uh, you know as compared to the uh, as compared to the samples with wherein we had added sucrose to the sample so again highlighting the fact that you know when you use function in metaproteomic studies we seem to get a better uh, separation of your samples and understanding of your samples um, we also uh, have used um, uh, you know meta quantum uh, to kind of not only identify um, 
proteins or functions that are expressed by the entire microbiome, but also to uh, go deeper and find out what's the contribution of uh, taxa to a particular functional process. So for example, in this case, uh, we were interested in carbohydrate metabolism, and the idea was to find out in control samples, uh, what is the contribution of different taxa uh, to carbohydrate metabolism? And as you can see that uh, Fusobacteriaceae family seems to be the most prominent uh, contributor to this in control samples, while uh, in presence of sugar, uh, streptococcus seem to have uh, taken over as the most um, uh, carbohydrate metabolism contributing um, uh, taxonomic um, unit. So this kind of also gives you an idea about uh, about how each um, taxonomy is contributing to uh, a particular function or how it you know also gives an idea about what are the major players uh, in a particular process uh, in a microbiome uh, host interaction. The other um, uh, perspective here is that we could also find out uh, if you're just interested in a particular organism or a particular family, in this case, we, we looked at streptococcus and tried to see how it behaved in control samples. Um, and it, you can see that nitrogen compound metabolic process seemed to be the most prominent one uh, in control samples, while uh, in terms of uh, in, in, in uh, samples wherein we had added sucrose, translation seemed to be the most prominent one, also giving an idea about um, if, if you were to look at just one particular taxon uh, unit or taxonomic unit, how what are the different functional processes uh, that one can do? And I think that gives a pretty good idea about um, the role of um, a particular taxon in in in, um, in its interacting with um, with the host as well as the environment. So um, this was about metaproteomics, um, and uh, you know, so I kind of highlighted the. Uh, the importance of using uh, metaquantum as a tool to um, to analyze some of the microbiome studies. We have also started using metatranscriptomics, and the idea here is to get a more complete picture of um, of, of the microbiome by not only looking at your metaproteomics data, but also uh, uh, you know analyzing metatranscriptomics data. Um, so Subina Mehta, uh, who's uh, the member of the Galaxy B team, has uh, worked extensively with the Galaxy B team as well as researchers in Europe to to ensure that this uh, workflow called Assign Workflow, which was published um, by Bernice Batut in 2018, uh, we kind of modified this, and this is uh, available as a workflow to analyze metatranscriptomics data as well, wherein you can take in FASTQ files. Uh, I won't go much into details about this again. I mean, there are a series of um, tools that are uh, that are used for identifying taxonomy as well as identifying the uh, function of the RNA, RNA uh, that is expressed by this microbiome. And it also gives you an idea about the taxonomy and functional interaction. Um, so using this workflow, um, we uh, we use this workflow on that, uh, on the carbohydrate, um, uh, oh, sorry, the cellulose degradation database, data set that I uh, mentioned earlier. And we could uh, find out, um, you know, in a time course analysis, the, the contribution of, um, of, of organisms, so in this case, Clostridium and Coprothermobacter were the major organisms present in this particular uh, uh, simple uh, in this particular um, degradation data set, and they seem to be uh, changing as you know as as time passes by, and that also gives an idea about uh, the role of these organisms um, in this uh, in the study. We could actually use uh, both taxonomic, uh, uh, both functional uh, analysis uh, from metatranscriptomics data to identify what are the different, how do the different functional uh, categories change uh, according, you know, uh, along with time. And um, we have also been studying the taxonomy and fun functional interaction um, by, you know, studying only what are the different functional pathways that have been expressed by coprothermobacter and asking uh, the question from uh, from a functional analysis point, if we were to look at a particular functional uh, output such as adenosine ribonucleotide de novo biosynthesis, what's the co contribution of different organisms, uh, you know, along with the time scale? So, uh, this metatranscriptomics data we believe is uh, giving us um, not it's it's doing two things. One is it gives you a template uh, so that you can generate your protein FASTA file for your metaproteomics analysis. But you can also um, independently analyze your metatranscriptomics data to uh, to get a perspective of how are these RNA uh, um, RNA molecules uh, from the microorganism getting expressed and how are they contribution to the function of uh, of the microbiome. 
and then we can also perform some kind of a correlation analysis uh, which is an ongoing work right now wherein um, you know if, if you have a meta transcriptomics data and if you perform your taxonomic abundance and functional abundance um, we would like to correlate that with uh, meta proteomics data which uh, you know which also gives you taxonomic and functional abundance but the idea would be to see um, how do these um, how do taxa as well as how do functions change um, either in two conditions or in a time course study uh, so that one can understand the role of um, how these particular microorganisms uh, seem to be interacting with the environment. So um, our, our long-term goal basically is to uh, not only use uh, our metaproteomics workflows and metatranscriptomics workflows on, um, on cancer samples, but also correlate it with uh, the host proteogenomics um, as well as host transcriptomics workflow that, uh, that Tim uh, mentioned earlier. So uh, Tim talked about using RNA-seq data to, uh, to generate your, you know, to identify novel peptides, but also identify peptides that are um, peptides or proteins that are uh, that have been annotated and are already present in sample. The idea would be to once we have all this quantitative data from uh, metaproteomics, metatranscriptomics, proteogenomics, as well as host transcriptomics, um, we hope that we, we should be able to use um, machine learning approaches or other approaches to kind of uh, make some kind of a correlation between um, how the microorganisms are affecting um, the host or vice versa, how is the host affecting uh, the microorganisms that are present um, in your um, in your host tissue. So uh, with that, uh, the last part that I'm going to uh, cover is basically how do we access um, these you know these tools and what are our future directions? What are the you know plans that we have for the future? So uh, in terms of these multiomics workflows uh, that I that both Tim uh, talked about as well as uh, I presented in the meta proteomics um, uh, session was that um, these are actually available as uh, public gateways. So one could you know one can go to these um, this this links here um, and then click on it. You can just register as well as start using some of the test data sets that we have there. So there are there is enough documentation available shown here in this uh, link. There are step-by-step -step instructions. Um, and then there's also a metaproteomics gateway, which, uh, you know, which can be accessed using these links here. Most of our tools and workflows are also available on um, our proteomics use galaxy.eu. So this is uh, in collaboration with the European Galaxy uh, community that we work with to ensure that the latest version of tools and workflows are also available not only to researchers within us but also um, uh, has a worldwide reach so anybody in in the world can access these tools and workflows um, if they have an account on um, on the use galaxy website um, for uh, those who have uh, you know an interest in in uh, tool development or have um, an interest in knowing a little bit more about these tools. You can also access these tools on GitHub, uh, on Galaxy Toolshed, uh, the Kravat P tool that Tim mentioned earlier, developed by Ray Sahulga, uh, was uh, is also available on Docker. Uh, we also work very closely with the uh, Galaxy training community, um, and there are training workflows available on this website, uh, which is uh, it's, a, it's a large uh, collection of um, training. Uh, for workflows as well as tools that are developed in Galaxy uh, called as Galaxy Training Network. So if you're interested in knowing about some of the tools that not only we have developed, but others have developed, uh, please go and visit this site. Um, lastly, we can be reached um, at, um, you know, you can contact us at uh, this this link here, uh, http galaxyp.org slash contact. Um, and then, you know, we, uh, our, most of our presentations as well as our publications are uh, on these links um, and we'll be very happy to hear of any interest in either using these tools or any questions that you have um, to use this in your project. Uh, lastly, I'd like to um, mention that we not only work with researchers in uh, University of Minnesota as was um, highlighted by Tim, but we also work with uh, researchers uh, from all over the world, especially some of the developers uh, who have developed some of these uh, interesting tools so that we can make them accessible through the Galaxy uh, workflows uh, so that they can be used on the projects that they are working on. Uh, we also work very closely with the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute, uh, especially James Johnson and Tom McGowan, who have been um, 
uh, instrumental in developing some of the uh, tools and workflows that we have uh, implemented in Galaxy. Um, with that, uh, I think both uh, Tim and I will be very happy to take any questions. Uh, and again, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving us an opportunity to give a to, to present our work. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much, guys. Yeah, and I'd just add, um, you know, as partly what we're 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 doing this for is, you know, as you get ideas, we you can definitely contact us if you just have project ideas, thoughts, um, questions. But also, you know, if you have grant proposals coming where suddenly it dawns on you, you have sort of some multi-omic types of data that could potentially um, benefit from this. You know, let us know. We've we've worked with a number of people trying to get some funding avenues going as well. I had a question regarding, um, you know, how you figure out where the novel peptide is coming from. So you show this nice uh, graphic where you show, you know, you identify the novel peptide and you are able to plug it in the software and say it came from this protein. But how, I mean, how can you do it with confidence if the sequence of that peptide is changed? So it's not the original protein sequence. Just to start with sure. understanding how it works. Yeah, well, it, it, so it depends on, I think, it's a good question. It depends on the nature of the variant. So, you know, if it's a single amino acid switch, like a substitution in the sequence, then it's pretty easy to because the rest of that peptide sequence is going to match to a, a known sequence that belongs to a certain protein. So that's a little easier to do. If it's a very um, sort of highly novel sequence, it's a you know structural variant where chromosomal translocations have happened and turned into a very odd protein, then it can be a little tricky. And there's some ways that you can do this. Um, JJ at the Supercomputing Institute has done a really nice job of sort of annotating those so that you actually can find, well, this was part of this peptide comes from this chromosome and part of this peptide comes from that mm -hmm. chromosome. But also the other piece of, of trying to sort of infer what full on protein that peptide came from is from looking at the rest of say the genomic region that would code for the protein around it and then that can give you some coordinates and some annotation to a protein. But so sometimes it can be kind of tricky knowing exactly the nature of these products, but it is sort of depends on the nature of the variant. Mm -hmm. Great. And then I had one more question about antiproteomics. So when, when you obtain the data, these proteins are coming from all the bacteria in the sample, whether it's like oral uh, sample or other sample. So how do you sort it out to assign these proteins to specific microorganisms? Pratik, do you want to handle that? Yeah, so um, what's the question regarding how do you assign these uh, peptides yeah. to proteins? Yeah, because from you, you, don't, yeah, you don't sort it into, like, separate the sample into I, I, I separate microorganisms. So all of your proteins, they're coming from a whole bunch of bacteria. So, that's right. what I'm asking. so it's sort of how do you assign a protein to a specific species Bacteria, of bacteria? Yeah, species, right. exactly. Right, right. So, um, uh, you know, so the, in terms of uh, assigning species uh, or to any, any strain or any uh, genus, uh, we basically rely on how unique this peptide is uh, to that particular species. So, for example, when you have a list of, let's say, 100 peptides that you have, um, most of the peptides end up, um, you know, being assigned to the root. For example, it could be assigned, you know, it could be present in all bacteria, in which case mm -hmm. we cannot assign, you know, um, uh, a particular taxonomy to this, uh, to these particular peptides, right? Because they are, they're present in, uh, they seem to be present in all bacteria. But then there are enough uh, peptides that you can uh, assign specifically to a particular genus or at a particular family or order level and, uh, so, you know, you use only these peptides to say that these are the peptides that um, that we can be uh, very sure of that they actually come from um, uh, from a particular taxonomic unit. So uh, that's how we assign those. Um, th now, you know, the, the advantage of using metaproteomics is that uh, those peptides that we have, um, you know, if you're looking at the function level, 
uh, it could be possible that your uh, peptide or your protein might be present in most of the bacteria, uh, but could have a particular function. And so in that case, you, when you're assigning a function, it becomes a little easier in the sense you, you're not really worried about which bacterium it comes from, but you basically assign that particular protein function um, and say that this particular micro, microbiome as such in, 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 in total seems to be expressing this particular protein or this function. So, uh, and that I think is a more powerful way of looking at your uh, microbiome data using metaproteomics um, uh, than taxonomy. Though, you know, uh, you know, we can also use metaproteomics for performing uh, taxonomic analysis. Uh, and that what, what fraction of these proteins are unique to specific bacteria species? And oh, what, what fraction, fraction of... Uh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't hear your question. Was it what uh, fraction of proteins are assigned to bacteria? What what fractions are unique? Just oh, um, again, species. it depends upon the how complex your um, your microbiome is. Uh, if if it is simple enough, wherein you have only you know four or five species or four or five genera, then I think it's uh, and again depending upon how much overlap there is there, it is the it's there between this. Um, uh, is uh, this this bacteria? Then uh, you end up um, getting quite a few unique peptides or proteins that you can assign to those taxonomy. But mm -hmm. again, if it's very complex, then uh, it becomes uh, difficult. So I would say, uh, at least in our hands, something like ten percent to fifteen percent uh, are unique peptides. Um, as you know, but again, this varies from uh, sample to sample. Uh, the more mm -hmm. complex the sample, the lower this value. While uh, if it's not as complex, uh, then it, it kind of, you can assign these peptides to uh, unique taxonomic units. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the nice presentation, Tim and Pratik. Um, I have a question about the proteogenomics pipeline. So when you go back to the RNA, is there a particular quality standard of RNA expression data that you need. So do you need like high quality RNA seq or can you do nano string? Is, are there restrictions? Are there recommendations? What works best? What's more most reliable? Mm, that's a great question. Um, yeah, you know, the deeper the better. You know, I think it's you can, you know, technically as long as there's some sequence there that you think is there, you can turn it into a hypothetical protein and then potentially identify it. But it definitely helps to have, you know, more reads that are backing up the, the variant that you are annotating and thinking is actually there. Um, we haven't yet really tried this on, you know, longer sequencing reads. So, but I think the general answer is, um, you know, having higher quality sequencing reads that you have more confidence in is going to give you more confidence too that the protein that you have identified is real as well. So they kind of go hand in hand, but there really isn't a guideline as to, you know, you have to have this, this amount of depth of reads or anything yeah. like that that's out there. So, um, but the more the better, because I, yeah. I think personally, I, I would like to use the sequencing the data quality of the sequencing reads that we're using to help me be more confident that the protein is actually there too. Yeah, right. Yeah. Thanks everyone for joining us today via Zoom and this concludes our program.